Would you just lift up and cast your cares on him now? Just begin to pray. Believe God for the issues of your life that need a touch. God, we worship you here now. You are the glory. You are the lifter of our head. You are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond what we could think, ask, or even imagine. You respond to those that are desperate, God, and those who come to you. They don't walk away hungry, but you fill the hungry with good things. Lord, we activate in our own lives now our desire, God. We, even as David did, we say to our own soul, break forth unto joy, O my soul. Lord, the dead things in our heart, we wake up now. God, we awaken. Lord, that which the enemy is trying to put to sleep, whether it be our eyes or our ears, God, we wake up now. We wake up in your presence because you are a good God and your love endures as we've sung. But Lord, you're sovereign. You're over all and you are our Father. We honor you here. Praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray for Larry Lester's granddaughter who will go in for an operation next Wednesday. And God, we pray for her now. We pray, Jesus, that you would heal her. Lord, whether you heal her through the doctors or all by yourself, God, however you desire to do it, we put her in the palm of your hand now. God, we pray that the air flow in her, her uh, throat and esophagus all would function as it's intended to function. There would be no stress at all to her heart. But Lord God, that she would just receive the fullness of the healing that you desire for her, God. We just thank you. We thank you and we praise you. Thank you, God. You know, I just wonder, Ben, if you could lead us in, in one more song. And, and as we sing this song, would you just open up your heart? We've been talking about the soil and, and the conditions of our heart. Would you just open up your heart to allow the Spirit of God to do whatever He desires to do, to sort of stir up anything that He wants to stir up, and to wake up anything that might be sleeping, because God has a plan and a purpose for our time together. So let's just um, sing one more song and, um, and open our heart to Him. Every day and every day I love to you to be the strength of my love. You're the hope I hold on to. You're the hope I hold on to to be the strength of my love. take our hands off the wheel. We recognize 
our need to do it. God, we recognize our need to surrender to you. We recognize our need to cease from striving, to be still and know that you're God, to listen and to gain understanding and discernment from your word as directed by your Holy Spirit. God, we open ourselves to that now. Do what only you can do, God. We praise you. We worship you. We honor you. You're worthy of all praise. All glory, all honor belongs to you. You are God and we are not. Praise you, God. Sing it one more time. You're the strength of my life. Let's declare it. You're the strength of my life. Strength of my life. Strength of my life. Strength Strength of my life, strength of my life, to the strength of my life, strength of my life, strength of my life, strength of my life, today. resolve that you're here that you are among us God and Lord we choose now God to engage and to, to remain in that place where you are the vine and we are the branches God we want to get our, our structure set straight this morning God and, and allow you to be exactly who you are in our lives once again we submit to you Holy Spirit we welcome you in this place not just in the around the room but in the place of our heart in the temple of our heart thank you God we love you and we honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Well, you can have a seat this morning. And thank you to our worship team for just really leading us. And Sylvia, thank you for that song. Um, it was just a beautiful song and really set us in the right direction of keeping our eyes on Jesus. Hey, this morning, um, as we do our service here in California, Emily Dombowski is listening online and maybe even watching in Northern Ireland. So everybody say hi to Emily this morning. Hi. So we're real proud of Emily and the, the decision that she's made to really follow the direction of the Lord. And, and uh, I got to see some of the pictures of where she's living in Northern Ireland and I know why she followed the direction of... No, I'm just kidding. No, it is just beautiful, beautiful place. And we know God has great things in store and we're really glad that she's listening this morning. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is give you a report. We've been talking about seeds being sown. Do you remember if you were here last week, um, we talked about the sower, the seed, and the soil. And, and in that, we understand that our, it's our role to, to sow the seeds of the gospel in, all over the world. And I want to give you a report of, um, of Robin Bowers, who's in Serbia right now, sowing seed. And God opened the door for her um, many, well, many months ago, almost a year ago. You might remember we had a speaker come here by the name of um, Pastor Alexander uh, Mitrovic. And Pastor Alexander is someone that we've supported for a number of years. And afterwards, God really moved on Robin's heart to get involved with what he was doing. And, and I share this as a way of saying, when these missionaries come, whether it's um, Lillian, who's going to be in Papua New Guinea, and who said, hey, you can come along with me, or Deidre, who's in Uganda, who I heard from this morning. And, um, but any one of these missionaries, the bridge is built for you. If, if you have the desire to go and you have the faith and the sense of calling, go for it. Go and see what God is doing in these places. And so Robin decided to do it. And, uh, and she went with a team. Um, and many of you know Ted Boltzma, who is leading that small team of people going and witnessing. And so anyway, she sent uh, an email, and I want to read it to you. Um, let me get it here. I forgot to print it out. So here it goes. Um, it says, hello, Pastor Danny. This is um, Ted writing for Robin. We've had a wonderful time here. Um, it says I'm forwarding some pictures and I feel lame reading that because I forgot to show you the pictures. But they're pictures of Robin like this with somebody and like this is somebody else that she met. So um, one picture is, is Robin with Sandra and Elena from our church. Last night we met Sandra and her friend Bain. And Bain was an atheist. Um, Bain, uh, for the first time, dedicated his life to Christ. Today Robin met Sandra who had just gotten high. 
and Robin challenged her to come clean. After meeting with pastor's wife, Daniela, um, they decided that Robin and Elena could have Sandra in their room to detox for three days. So praise God for that. And please keep her in prayer for a breakthrough over the next three days. The funny thing, Sandra doesn't speak English. But between Robin and Elena's Spanish, they are communicating just fine. Now, I've been, I'm pretty sure they don't speak Spanish in Serbia. So I'm just trying to figure out what that looks like. And if I, uh, you know Robin, and I'm sure it, it, you could imagine what that looks like. And Spanish and the Holy Spirit and um, Serbian are just somehow communicating here, I'm sure. <laughs> and it says they're communicating just fine. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, this is amazing because the pastor Bronco and his wife Daniela would never be able to do this. Um, so with Robin and Elena's help, they can get, help to get her clean and in a program and disciple her and so forth. Um, there was another report that came later that just shared of, of um, other opportunities to go and speak in different places. And so just wanted to, to, to bring that report to you. I want to ask you to keep these two in prayer, specifically Bain and, and Sandra. Um, one of the things that happened in, uh, one day into her detox, um, the lady, de de she um, fell off the wagon once again and they had to um, send her away. And it was a very difficult thing for Robin to do, but it doesn't mean that God isn't doing something. And I shared with Robin the same message that I shared with you, that the seed is ours to scatter. It's God who calls us to sow the seed. Some of us are to water it, but who brings the growth? God does. And so um, at any rate, we just trust God with her. And so, in fact, can we just take a moment and pray over this uh, woman, Sandra, now and her boyfriend, Bain, as the seed has been sown, but who knows? You know, maybe there was some shallow soil there. Maybe there's some thorns in their life. Uh, or maybe just in a in short amount of time, uh, God will cause what started, what he began to be completed. And so, Lord, we this morning, God, want to recognize the power of your gospel, the power of the seed that can get sown, that it's changing lives and transforming hearts. And so today we would pray that, Jesus, you would touch this woman, Sandra, and, God, that you would touch her boyfriend, Bain. No doubt they were uh, impacted by the message, and I pray now that you would allow it to take deep root in the soil of their hearts so that they might grow and be transformed. And we want to honor you and believe you, God, that you can do anything. And so we trust you with these two now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, hey, if you think about it throughout your days, um, be praying for this team of um, people who are ministering there in Serbia. Um, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew in chapter 13. And as you turn there, I'll give you a little bit of a review if you weren't here last week or if you were, and I'll give it to you anyways. But we talked about the sower and the seed and the soil. And I want to continue on along the same lines and take another pass by the same parable and, and look to um, hear from the Lord maybe some more about what we can take away from this message that Jesus gave. Um, we talked about the, the three parts of the, the, the um, parable. One being that the sower's job was to sow the seed. It wasn't necessarily to have to determine the condition of all the soil, but to be faithful with the message. And understanding that what was being sown within the message was the seed. That the seed in and of itself, as I showed you a picture, was alive. That there was an embryo inside that seed and the seed was protected. It had a hard shell around it. And then if that seed could find a, a place to take root, it would come alive and, and bear fruit in a person's life that would produce a crop that would be 30, 60, and 100 fold. You remember all of that? And so we know that it was an encouragement for some of us who might be weary in our sowing of seeds. You know, some of us might think, well, it's just not worth it anymore, man. I've been telling this person, I've been praying for, how many stories do you know? Maybe some of you have them yourself of those that have prayed for 15, 20, 30 years for somebody and had sown seed into their life that entire time. And maybe it's just on their deathbed or maybe it's moments before um, th their life is taken or whatever that they accept this seed and it has fallen on good soil. And I want to encourage you, don't grow weary in doing good, that continue to sow the seed because it's not uncommon for three-fourths of the people who you're throwing seed into to not accept the seed that you're throwing. That's what the parable teaches us, that only a quarter of these people received what was being um, spoken. But it was all part of a greater plan and it needed to happen. And it wasn't insignificant. Each bit of the sowing of seed was not insignificant. And neither is your message into somebody's life. And neither is the message that is being sown into your life over and over and over again. You know, there's a, a, a God who loves you, obviously, who's just telling you some of the same things over and over and over again. And he's using people. And he's using his own word. And he's using opportunities like this to continue to sow in. Listen to what he has to say. Um, the next one was about the... Uh, 
the, the seed, I already said, and then finally was the soil. We talked about the soil, that there was um, different kinds of soil, and based on the kind of soil was how the seed was able to take root or not take root. And that's really where I want to end up this morning and go back through the various kinds of soil, and in that, really look at what our response is um, to what God is speaking to us. Some of you might think today, well, you know, I'm already a Christian. Maybe some of you aren't. And man, I'm so glad you, you're here if you are or if you aren't. But this parable is more than just a parable about evangelism. It's a parable about the Word of God and what we do when we hear it. And so in order to understand it a little bit more, let's look at the Scripture together um, in Matthew chapter 13. I'm just going to read it. There's going to be a lot, so buckle up. <laughs> you know, honestly, let the Word of God wash over you. The, I've had opportunity to, to sit with some pastors who have been in the ministry for many years, and, and we were exhorted. I, I shared with you the church was so gracious to send me to a training seminar um, with Jack Hayford. And one of the things he said is, pastors, read scripture. Read it. Read it out loud. And, and let it wash over your people. And, you know, I have to admit, I'm not the best public reader. Sometimes I stumble over what I read. But I'm going to keep doing it. Not because I want to impress you with my skills, but because I want you to hear the richness of God's Word. That if there's anything that I say through trying to um, bring to life or break open this Word, then praise God. But this Word all by itself can speak to you. I mean, you might just get the nugget right now and you can doze off for the rest of the service. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. It says, The same day Jesus went out to the house... Uh, and sat by the lake. And such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. And while all the people stood on the shore, he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seeds. And as he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on a rocky place where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, and thirty times what was sown. And then he says this, He who has ears, let him hear. In this next little portion, I want you to listen, because what we find out is it's a, it's a parable about all these things, but it really a lot, has a lot to do with what we hear and what we see. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever has an abundance, um, whoever, sorry, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, who have been ever hearing but never understanding, who have been ever seeing but never perceiving. For these people's hearts have come calloused, and they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn. And guess what? He says, I would heal them. Verse 16 says, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and blessed are your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long, have longed to see what you see but did not see it, and hear what you hear but did not hear it. And then he's, he unfolds the parable. Listen then to what the parable about the sower means. If anyone has ears to hear the message about the kingdom of God and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown into his heart. This seed is sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once with joy receives it. But since it has no root, it lasts only a short time. When the trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. And he who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. I added out because I always think of choking out. Okay, anyways... Choke it, uh, making it unfruitful. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 30, uh, sorry, 160 or 30 times what was sown. Pastor Carl used to always say, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. And anytime a large portion of scripture is said, I want to say that too. 
we look at this and we understand some things and, and what we understand is that there are many things being said, many messages being sent to you by God from people, by Him directly Himself. And some of us, by, by way of the condition of our heart, either have eyes to see or ears to hear, or we don't. Meaning by our choice, we either shut down to what God is saying or we're wide open to it. Even right now in this moment, you have that same opportunity. And, and i got to tell you, I have sat through probably thousands of sermons. I had to listen to myself week after week. Imagine. No, but even, even growing up in the church, that there have been plenty of times where I've sat and I've just disengaged and I've gone into some sort of autopilot mode where I kind of know what's going to happen next and I know where they're heading and I know what I know and I know that I know that I'm a prideful man. And that I know that a prideful man knows what he thinks. He thinks he knows what he's talking about. And I know that it, within any of us, that this, this condition that we have of a fallen flesh when we're, when we're um, presented with opportunities to hear what God is saying, if we're not aware of the need for humility in our lives, and I'm speaking to myself, then we'll miss a message. And when the seed is being sown, whether it's a simple seed or whether it's profound, whether we like what we're hearing or we don't like what we're hearing, if we don't humble ourselves before God and, and just resign the fact that He's in control and He wants to say something, we miss so much. And that's the essence of a lot of what this parable is saying. The first soil that it's being spoken of is the soil that is sown along the path. And where there's actually no soil at all. Remember what it says here in 13, um, 19. Anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This seed was sown along the path. I call this um, having no room. There's no room. There's no room to hear. Um, maybe you, you know of people who know everything, right? And, and part of their mantra before you can finish your sentence is, I know, right? That, that as you begin to say, hey, maybe you ought to think about, I know, I know, I thought about that. I think it's, um, <laughs> it, it, it comes in by way of people who really are wise. I'm not making fun of anybody, but they've had a lot of experiences in life. And so maybe they've, they've heard something before and it's just, yes, I know. And you can't really get past the I know factor. Am I the only one who's ever met somebody like that? I know, you've met him too, I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> but there's a sense that, that everything is known. There's no room. There's no room for God. And this, this seed can be sown on and on. And this is the pride of life and, and, and the, the, the needs of the things of this world have so overtaken a person that there's no room. And I've got to just say it before I say anything else. And maybe there are some of you that are sitting in this service that have never received Christ before, but you've heard his message and you know. I've talked to people, I've tried to evangelize to people where they could tell me the gospel with great detail. And they can say, guess what, I know. And you know what else I know? And, and then they continue on with all the reasons for not accepting the seed that was sown. The thing that we have to remember about the seed is it's not just words or a story, but the seed is alive. And what I want to tell you today, if there's no room for the seed in your life, I just want to remind you, you're getting ripped off. You're getting ripped off. That's what scripture tells us. The seed is alive and it's looking for a place to plant in your heart. It, it's so basic and you've heard it before because I know that you know and I'm not being uh, obnoxious and I'm not being a smart aleck. But what I'm saying is when you hear a scripture like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That there is a perishing consequence to not accepting the seed. And there's also a benefit of everlasting life that comes with the deep rootedness of the seed. The, the scripture, if you read in that John um, 3 passages and it goes on, it says the verdict is in and basically men love darkness. And yet if we come into Christ, we choose to allow him to turn on the lights. What a great thing. If you, if you remember back in your own conversion experience, for some of you, I know it's been relatively recent that you've given your heart to the Lord. And I love to see what happens in your eyes because your eyes have new light. It, it, it's, it's amazing that, that uh, Ron, I'm just thinking about you because you're just full of Jesus. And, and I, I watch you and you came, you rededicated your life to your, he was in the second row right there. We sat, we prayed, and he asked Jesus to come and be the Lord of his life. And I watched something happen. I watched dim eyes become alive and have light because the lights turned on. It wasn't because Ron's wonderful, it's because Jesus in him is. Does that make sense? And you see, if you have got the lights turned off, I welcome you to, to just... Receive the message. Just receive it. Receive the message in your heart and let the lights turn on because it will take root in your life and the seed is alive. And, and, and I have to say this.
because it's not said so often anymore, in which I'll get into my next point, because we don't like to get offended. The offense is that if you don't choose it, there really is that consequence of perishing. And the perishing doesn't just mean eternal perishing, although that's horrible, horrible, a horrible thought to think of eternal separation from God on any level. But to see the daily theft that happens in your own life, that you don't get to enter into this idea of everlasting life, but moment by moment, day by day, you're being stolen from. And so I, I just say this, if there's no room for the message, my only challenge is this to you, begin to make room. Begin to seek him like you've never sought him before and make room and let this thing take root because the seed is alive. The seed's okay all by itself and it will take root if you let it. The, the next part of the soil is in 1320. It's the one who receives the seed that falls on rocky places. And this is the man who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has, it has no root. And it lasts only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he falls away quickly. I want to spend a little bit of time on this soil because I think that although there might be some who have no room, there's probably a more of a majority of us myself included at times, who have just a certain amount of room for the seed in our life. In fact, if you picture what this might have looked like, if you picture rocks, you know, a rock formation with some soil around, what you have is compartments, right? It's compartments of soil. And that means that the seed can go where you determine that it, it goes. So you've got some room for it. You've made this little bit for soil, but this is a rock. This is a little bit for soil, and this is a rock. Do you see what happens? And how often we compartmentalize our life and how often we say that by our actions, maybe we don't willfully mean to do it, but by our actions and our thought processes, we say, God, you are welcome into 47% of my life and you can have all of that, every little bit of it, every Sunday, every Wednesday, I'll do every volunteer thing, all of it. But what he's saying is I don't want 47%, I don't even want 98%. But in order for the seed to really produce the fruit, it has to take root in good soil. The, the soil can't have rocks in it. And we've, we've learned to compartmentalize our lives, and it re produces a quick falling away. And this is the picture that we get from this particular so, um, story. The seed falls into one of these little compartments, right? And it, and it bursts up quickly. You'll remember this from last week. And when the sun comes to shine down upon it, Luke says there's no moisture there in his account of this parable. But the sun, which is designed to cause it to grow, does what? scorches it and kills it. And in Jesus' explanation of the parable, it's when persecution, tests and trials come into our life. When the seed has no root, we fall away. Now this is where, um, where I want to <laughs> get down and dirty. No. <laughs> the word that it uses for quickly falling away is the same word in the Greek language that we get the word scandal from or scandalous. And it's also translated as offended. We get offended. We get offended when tests and trials or persecution because of the word come into our life because we've believed this thing that it's supposed to go the way we want it because we're in control of our life and we've invited the seed of God's word to come in to do exactly what we want it to do, to come in and to enhance every part of our life. And when it doesn't do that, it's a scandal. It is scandalous for us. We get totally upset and we get offended. We get offended at God. We get definitely offended at His people. We get offended at the world. We get cynicism that comes and creeps into our life. And, and what this process occurs where whatever roots that we had are now gone and fried away. And it leads into a falling away. You know, that there is, and I've said this before, there's a cardinal sin of the humanist world today. Do you know what the cardinal sin is? The sin that just cannot be committed, whether it's in the public school system or whether it's... Um, in a hospital or wherever in your sector of work or whatever. The most horrible thing in the humanistic world that you can do to another person is offend them. Isn't it true? I want you to think about it. I, I wanted that to just go, whoa, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so let me say it again. I just dropped something that was like, yes, you should say, wow, that is really a good point. The cardinal sin, the thing that is a huge no-no. And you know what I mean by the humanist world. It's the prevailing philosophy of our day that says you have the greatest love and wisdom inside of you and, and no one can tell you what is right or wrong but you. That there is no standard of morality. There's no standard of truth. There's no standard of anything outside of what you determine is the standard. That's kind of a sloppy definition and a spit bubble of humanism. 
And the humanism thought process tells you that if you offend somebody else's morality or if you say that what they're doing is wrong or if you open up this idea that, that hurts their feelings, that that is horrible, that is a hate crime, that is punishable, hopefully by the law someday in their thought processes. I, am I making sense? And so this is the deal, this is the world that we live in. And, and, and here's the, the thing that I, I want to present to you about the seed of God's word. And you probably already know this to be true, but let me just say, you that, to say this to you. I say you this. <laughs> the seed is offensive. The seed in and of itself, the seed that is alive, this embryo that's being planted, is an offense. And what, it is an, what is it an offense to? Everything about you and me. Everything about us. Because we were wired in this fallen world. And, and our self and our, our ideas, our ambitions, our, our us, the ugliness of us being charge, in charge of us, the gospel is sown into our life and begins to offend every part of us. It wrecks us. And you see, what we are in this process of in, in the days that we live in is we want to bring ourself into the seed and just let the seed do what we want it to do. You know, there's a profound author, and he's a, um, a, uh, a translator of the Bible as well, Eugene Peterson. And I've been reading this book of his. It's called Eat This Book, you know. And I got it at the bookstore, and they're like, oh, is it going to be tasty? You know, so... It comes from the book of Revelation when it's, an, when it's talking about the seed of God's word. That the seed of God's word isn't something just to be read and understood, but it's to be digested. And it's to literally, because again, the seed is alive and it's supposed to transform our life. And what about us is it transforming? It's taking the you out of you. The fallen you. The messed up you. The selfish you. The rebellious you. And, and maybe you're getting offended right now, but I can easily look in the mirror and go, I am selfish, rebellious and messed up. And outside of the seed of God being sown in my life, I will continue on a path of rebellion and selfishness and judgment and all this garbage. But when the seed gets sown in me, and it falls not in just a compartment, but it falls in good soil, it grows and it gets the self out of me. I want to read you a portion of this book and I, and I hope that um, you can buckle up with me for a minute because I think that it might explain to you um, this idea of, of how we are looking at the seed in our lives sometimes. Um, the bottom line is this, as I was looking at this, I thought we've only got a few choices because nothing is wrong with the seed. And you might remember last week I said, we don't need to change the seed. It's fine. It's alive. But when the seed offends us, like it, it, it has a tendency to do, we have to either submit to the offense and say, okay, God, you're right. You're right. I mean, has anybody ever called you on something recently and been right? I, I've been called recently and they've been right. And I didn't want them to be right. And, and, and I didn't want to respond in the right way. You know, because why? Because I'm, I'm messed up. Your pastor is messed up. <laughs> but let me tell you something. In love, so are you. We are messed up. And so when, when truth comes to our messed up nature, we rebel. We rebel. And even though we know that we know that it's true, the, the, the pride of life strikes up and we rebel. And we rebel with, I know, or we rebel with, no it isn't, or we rebel with some kind of thing that sounds a lot like my two kids when they're arguing. And it just sort of carries on through the rest of life. And so when, when, um, when we come to grips with this offensive message, which by the way doesn't just offend for no reason, but it offends to give life, it offends to give us everlasting life. It wounds us so that it could heal us. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of the enemy. That's what the Proverbs teach. Now, when you read this, um, Eugene Peterson says, the way that we read the Bible often is through our eyes of humanism. We read it through our eyes of, of wanting it to enhance this new trinity that we've created. And he calls it the holy, what is this, the holy desires, the holy... I'll, I'll get to it. I think the holy desires, the holy needs, and the holy emotions. That's what often we can replace with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what's being said. And, um, and love me for saying it to you. Okay? We live in an age in which we have all been trained from the cradle to choose for ourselves what is best. We have a few years of apprenticeship at this before we are sent out on our own. But the training begins early. By the time we can hold a spoon, we can choose between a half a dozen cereals for breakfast, ranging from Cheerios to cornflakes. Our tastes, inclinations, and appetites are consulted endlessly. 
We are soon deciding what clothes we, are, we will wear and what style we will have to cut our hair, um, what TV channels we view and what courses we will take in school and what college we will attend and what course we will sign up for and what model of car or color we will buy and what church we will join. And we will learn early with multiple confirmations as we grow older that we have to essay in the formation of our lives with certain bounds. The decisive say, the culture does a thorough job on us, and if it turns, um, if it turns out to a, my, sorry, let me sorry, and if it turns out to be mighty effective with most of us, we enter childhood with a working assumption that whatever we need and want and feel forms the doctrine control of our lives. The new holy trinity is the sovereign self expresses itself is the holy needs, the holy wants, and the holy feelings. The, and um, the time and intelligence that our ancestors spent on understanding the sovereignty revealed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are directed by our contemporaries in affirming and validating the sovereignty of our needs, our wants, and our feelings. My needs are non-negotiable. My so-called rights um, defined by individually, um, defined individually and are fundamentally um, to my, uh, fundamental to my identity. My needs are my expression for affirmation, sexual gratif gratification, respect. I need to get my own way. All these provide a foundation and a centrality of me. I'm going to keep going. I hope you're hearing me. My wants are evidence by, of my expanding sense of kingdom. I train myself to think big, so I'm big, I'm important, I'm significant, I'm larger than life, and so I require more goods, more services, more things, more power. Consumption and acquisition are the new fruits of my spirit. My feelings are the truth of who I am, and anything or person can provide me with ecstasy, excitement, with joy, with stimulus, with spiritual connection, that validates my sovereignty. This, of course, involves employing quite a large cast of therapists, travel agents, gadgets, and machines, recreations and, and entertainments to cast out the devils of boredoms or loss of content. All the feelings that under, undermine or challenge my sovereign self. I hope you caught a portion of that because that's the heart of what I believe um, we're to take away from the idea of the seed. That's this, the ugliness of who we are in and of ourself is that we will continue to want to consume more and more and more. And we will want to not allow the Word of God to transform our life. But what we'll want to do is to take the principles of the Word of God and try to work really hard to make ourselves more and more holy. My daughter uh, came home from school and she's in the public school system and uh, and I'm happy with her education, and, I, and yet we prayed about it. We knew going into it that there would be a, a level of countering some of the doctrines and philosophies that she's taught, and, and we believed it was the right step for us. And we do this thing in our house where often we say, hey, tell me something that you're thankful for. It's just a practice. We all want to just nurture an attitude of thankfulness. And so my wife says to Kate, Kate, what's, what's something that you're helpful for? What, what are you thankful for? And she says, I'm thankful for me. You know? And, and that's fine. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a, a healthy self-esteem. But she, we went on to say, would you tell us, um, <laughs> because it just triggered something that I wonder, you know, what's being sewn into her right now. And so she went on to tell us this creed that she's learning in school. And it caused chills to run up and down my spine. Because she, she like a robot, went on for three minutes, I'm not exaggerating, saying that there is no person on this world, including her parents, preachers, or teachers, who could tell her what is right for her, but she determines what is right for her. And it had a, a meter and a tone to it, and it is right for me. And it was really cutesy, and, um, and I, I pledge allegiance to myself and who I am, uh, you know, accountable to. I mean, I'll, I don't know exactly what it is. And it just kept, we, we were just like, ah, I'm melting! <laughs> And it goes on and on. And the end result is, I will listen to no voice but the voice that lives inside of me. I thought, holy smokes. I'm so glad we asked the question. And obviously we sat down with our daughter. And again, this isn't a, this isn't a, um, I don't want to be the rant and rave preacher against the, the culture and society. I'm not saying that. It is what it is, okay? You're in it. 
You're living in it. You're not called to waste your time trying to combat it in a way that's not effective and healthy, but what you're called to do is live a godly life in the midst of it and to train and teach your children to do the same. And so in that, we didn't go down and, and hold up a banner and say, no more of this chant. I'm, I'm tr deeply troubled. I don't know what quite to do about it, but one thing I do know is that as I sat with my daughter, I said, what's the voice that lives inside of you? Jesus. I go, all right, we're good. And I'll continue to do that. And I think that you should continue to do the same with your kids. But more importantly, this is a message that's being taught to her right now. And it's going to grow up inside of her. And it's going to need to be combated with something. Guess what that something is? It's a seed. It's a seed that's alive. It's not the ranting and ravings of a preacher. It's a seed that is the word of God. And if that seed can take root in your life, you've got nothing to be afraid of. In this world that is so full of fear. Golly, I, you can't even watch the news without just shuddering in your bones about all the horrible things that are going to happen like tomorrow. If you've got the seed alive in you, you've got nothing to worry about. And it's growing. You know, this idea of offense, I'm, I'm going to let it go because I think you get the point. Um, we need to make room. We need to make room for the fullness of what, what the gospel is in our lives. i just going to kind of drop it from here because I want to just share with you a testimony and then I'm going to end it. You, you, you know the story. You know the gospel. And if you don't, I gave you a portion of scripture that will really allow it to come alive. And if you want it, God so wants to sow the seed into the fertile soil of your heart. But this week, um, I had a, a particular heavy thing on my heart, you know. And e even honestly preparing this message, I mean, I just was heavy with the the weight of the idea of what this seed is and just wanting so desperately to say, it isn't just saying the sinner's prayer, but it's opening your heart completely to the Word of God in every aspect of your life and letting it grow there. And you can determine a part of that by how you respond to God. But the way that you, the way that you um, allow your, your soil to be good is not by working really hard. It's not by reading this book 17 hours out of a 24-hour day. None of that would hurt anything. But God so spoke to me this week as I strived and strived and strived to be smart and wise and helpful and hopeful and prayerful and studyful. I got to this point and I, and I was just heavy with a burden. How many of you are heavy with a burden? Just raise your hand. Do you have a burden? Well, if you don't, buckle up. There's one coming, okay? So, <laughs> so heavy with a burden. It's not even important what the burden is, you know, and I don't even want you to think about it, but what I want you to understand is it was heavy enough to just go, God, what? You know what I did? I mean, I was literally, well, what does your word say about it? What does your word say about it? Reading, and, and I read a lot, but I was like, mm. I went upstairs, and I, I, I found a room, and I locked the door, and I prayed. And I prayed not a highly emotional prayer, I didn't do a dance. I didn't, you know, I just said, God, I was, in fact, sitting in a chair, just talking to God and said, God, I need you. I, I, and you know what I said? I give up. <laughs> I have, this, we're going on like a lot of hours here, and I'm hearing nothing. On a lot of days, I'm hearing nothing. I give up. And, and God, and I wasn't angry at God, and I wasn't cocky. But what I said is, God, if you don't speak to me or send somebody to do it, I have no idea what to do, and I can't do it. And I won't because I don't know what to do. And I laid on my face before God. It was the most dramatic thing I did in that whole prayer thing. And I wasn't weeping and there was no snot coming out of my nothing. I just laid on my face before God. I spent time on the carpet and I said, God, just take it. I just give up. I surrender. I surrender. I don't know what to do. And I listened. Five minutes. Got up, locked the door, went back, sat down in my office. Looked at my phone and there was a message on my phone. And it was from a pastor friend of mine. You might know Nick Goff, who lives in Montana. Picked up the phone and I called Nick. He didn't even say hello. He just, I heard him and he was praying. He's like, you are so heavy on my heart right now. I don't even know what to do. And he just began to speak into my life. Five minutes without even taking a breath. This thing, that thing, this thing, that thing. You know, spoke to my need. I couldn't have scripted it. I couldn't have scripted that kind of thing. You've had those experiences in your life. Why did it come? It came birthed out of desperation that I didn't want to approach the seed by self. 
I was trying so hard to make God do what I wanted because God offended me because he didn't, it was scandalous. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. It didn't fit in my compartment where that seed was sown. Give up, guys. Just give up. Surrender. Let it go. Just let it go. Let it go because, see, here's the deal in all of Scripture. What it teaches us is that to obey is better than sacrifice. He wants your obedience. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. That this whole thing of the gospel is by grace. And so if you want the seed to take root in your life, you can't strive to get it. So guess what you have to do? Surrender. Give up. It isn't about your trying, but it's about your giving up before God. And what are you giving up? You're giving up you. This, my wife taught about it. The sin of self is what you're giving up. And it is so deeply rooted in our culture and in our lives. I don't know how this hits you today. And I don't mean this in a hard way, like, not like I don't care. I don't care, meaning... I'm going to say it even if it doesn't hit you because it hit me so profoundly. And i got to trust that this is going on right now. Amen. This is a profound truth that where self reigns, God can't. And we're messed up. And there's a parable that teaches us what we can do to have ears to hear and have eyes to see. And the disciples were getting this parable. And they were hanging on the words of it and they were trying to understand it. And if you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear, I really truly believe that if you want to prepare your soil, do the Bible study. Pray the prayers. Do do the stuff. I'm not saying don't do it. But if it doesn't come first out of a place of surrender, out of a place of giving up, out of a place of humility, if you don't have the time to do it, please make the time to check yourself. This is like a, a, a temperature type gauge thing. Plug into God and say, God, you've got the right to look into my life because I've laid down my rights. Teach me. Search me. Know me. Show me my pride. Oh, boy, that is a painful prayer. Most of us who think we're humble have a lot of pride. And when God turns the lights on, you just go, wow, God, you're right. What a funny statement. The all-knowing God having the ability to read your mail. And I tell that testimony to you because it was profound in my life, but I tell it to you as hope that God will hear you. He's active. He's available. But some of the times when he doesn't fit in your compartment is because he's, he is bringing you to that desperate point where you'll let go of yourself. You don't have the greatest love of all living inside of you in and of yourself. But what you have living inside of you is the spirit of the living God. You have a seed that's alive. And if you will yield to the Holy Spirit and, and die to yourself, you will have a, a seed that is planted so deeply and so rooted so profoundly that you will bear much fruit and fruit that will remain. Can we stand together this morning? Ben, will you come? And um, I want to give us a little bit of time, just a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes to process through the soil of our hearts. The point that I didn't get to that I could tell you in 30 seconds is this. There's the the seed that there's no room for. There's a seed that there's a compartment for. And then the final one is there's a seed where there's just too much room. And the room is not only for the seed that God wants to sow, but it's also the seed of all the other thorns and things that get in. And so whether you're here today and you've got no room, I invite you to cry out to God and just say, God, there's room now. Let the seed be sown. If you've got a compartment and you want to blow away the rocks and and just say, God, I, I, I surrender myself and all of me trying to do my stuff, even me trying to serve you and whatever on my own and surrender that. But if you've got too much room in your life right now, whether you're embracing what it says in Scripture, the seed that's sown, but also the worries of the world, And the deceitfulness of wealth. The essence of the deceitfulness of wealth is to say, if I just had enough money, it would be fun and fine. And somehow, and I don't know why, but we live in a society in Orange County and the surrounding counties where that is just a prevailing gospel. That we want a little bit of Jesus and a lot of wealth and we'll be good. (laughs) Just check yourself, that's all. I'm doing it. Let's just sing a song and, um, and allow the Holy Spirit to let what needs to take root, take root. You have my heart, and I am yours forever. You are my strength, 
God of grace and power and everything you hold in your hands stay and make time for me can't understand so we praise you God of earth and sky how beautiful is your sometimes it doesn't on an intellectual one and for these that are desperate for different reasons saying hey I got seed but I also got weeds and I need these weeds and thorns to be gone Lord I pray you'd move in their life God for the one who says I've got seeds but they're growing up in these little pockets and compartments and I'm offended at you Jesus because you're not doing what you're supposed to do in that compartment Lord I pray you'd release them God release them from themselves release us God from the sin of self God, free us into this new level of surrender before you. And God, for the ones, Lord, who have come this desperate and say, I don't even think I have room, but I've heard something today that wants to create room. 
Oh, Lord, we bless them today. What better of a decision could be made than to believe in you and understand that if we believe and receive you, that we can have everlasting life and not perish. So for these, God, we just pray your blessing. And we want to pray this prayer together. It starts with a prayer of confession, but it goes on with a life that's discipled and, and, and growing into fruition. So can we say this prayer together with those that are saying it for the first time? I'm just inviting that seed of Jesus into their, their soil of their life. Let's declare, just say, Dear Jesus, I welcome you into my heart. I know that I'm a sinner. And I need you. I need you to heal me of myself come alive in me so that I might die and that you would live through me. I believe what you did on the cross was real. You died for my sin so that I could have everlasting life. I receive you now as my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rejoice together. Praise God. Father, I bless each one. God, I pray that you would send them out with joy. You would lead them forth with peace. I give them hope in hopeless situations. And God, for all of us, that we would walk more surrendered, more humble, and more obedient to you than ever before. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Oh, yo. Yeah.